Coach Hank alluded to uh, so eloquently there with two of the worst athletes ever to play the game of football, Tim McGarvey and Chris Batty. Uh, just by doing it in a small demonstration, let alone in front of 100,000 people, just how difficult it is to tackle. So uh, I appreciate those guys doing that. And Coach Hank, I didn't know you still had your helmet and your shoulder pads, but they look like they're in pretty darn good shape. So um, first and foremost, uh, to, to Jeff and everyone at TCYFL, we want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank everyone for coming out and hopefully uh, improving and getting better as a person. That's what football and that's what coaching is all about. You're influencing people and hopefully you feel like you get better today as a person so that you can go back and influence those that are underneath your guidance through the great game of football. How many of you do uh, coach for a living? That's all you do. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. That's only my guys over there in the corner. Uh, and that's kind of my point here initially is you have a calling. For some reason, at some point in your life, you decided to get involved by influencing young people. And through the great game of football, we're all here today. And if you think about that power of influence that you have, I'll rewind back to when I started the game of football in the second grade. I'm originally from a town called Orland Park, a southwest suburb. I played for the Orland Park Pioneers. And uh, I was that kid in the second grade uh, that couldn't sit still, that was bouncing around all day long, daydreaming, writing little football plays on my homework that was supposed to be turned in on time. Uh, and my teachers and the administration in the Orland uh, Park School District told my mom that I need to do something with my time a little bit more constructively so that I focus a little better in school. Uh, now I think they call it ADHD and things of that nature, so I wasn't diagnosed with any of that stuff. I just had it, and I still have it. And uh, so my mom started me playing football. Now I'm a father of three, and I'm trying to convince my wife with a kindergartner who's 85 pounds that it's okay to start playing football. Uh, but my biggest issue is not necessarily whether or not he's going to be good enough to play or if he'll like to play. Frankly, it's the coaching. I want to know whether or not he's going to be put in a safe environment. I want to know whether or not he's going to be taught the game the right way, not necessarily always about the scheme and the plays, but how to play the game of football and what it can teach you about life and more importantly, how we can keep them safe. So hopefully through that tackling technique that Hank talked to you about, uh, you know, you can go back and that's really the thing that paranoids me most uh, is just the tackling technique and that full speed collision that happens at the point of attack. And last year in college football, we had a really difficult lesson learned on the, on the, on the kickoff play for the young man at Rutgers. And uh, so hopefully you take a little bit out of that. Before I forget, I'd like to invite everybody up to come watch us play. Uh, we have tickets that are available not only uh, for high school student athletes that are recruits, but also for you as uh, grade school coaches and our high school coaches or administrators. And uh, bring your players up. I know we have some uh, salute to Midwest football games. Coach Hank alluded to uh, so eloquently there with two of the worst athletes ever to play the game of football, Tim McGarvey and Chris Batty. Uh, just by doing it in a small demonstration, let alone in front of 100,000 people, just how difficult it is to tackle. So, uh, I appreciate those guys doing that. And Coach Hank, I didn't know you still had your helmet and your shoulder pads, but they look like they're in pretty darn good shape. So, um, First and foremost, uh, to, to Jeff and everyone at TCYFL, we want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I want to thank everyone for coming out and hopefully uh, improving and getting better as a person. That's what football and that's what coaching is all about. You're influencing people and hopefully you feel like you get better today as a person so that you can go back and influence those that are underneath your guidance through the great game of football. How many of you do uh, coach for a living? That's all you do, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, that's only my guys over there in the corner. Uh, and that's kind of my point here initially is, you have a calling. For some reason, at some point in your life, you decided to get involved by influencing young people. And through the great game of football, we're all here today. And if you think about that power of influence that you have, I'll rewind back to when I started the game of football in the second grade. I'm originally from a, a town called Orland Park, a southwest suburb. I played for the Orland Park Pioneers, and uh, I was that kid in the second grade uh, that couldn't sit still, that was bouncing around all day long, daydreaming, writing little football plays on my homework that was supposed to be turned in on time. Uh, and my teachers and the administration in the Orland uh, Park School District told my mom that I need to do something with my time a little bit more constructively so that I focus a little better in school. Uh, now I think they call it ADHD and things of that nature, so I wasn't diagnosed with any of that stuff. I just had it, and I still have it. 
And uh, so my mom started me playing football. Now I'm a father of three, and I'm trying to convince my wife with a kindergartner who's 85 pounds that it's okay to start playing football. Uh, but my biggest issue is not necessarily whether or not he's going to be good enough to play or if he'll like to play. Frankly, it's the coaching. I want to know whether or not he's going to be put in a safe environment. I want to know whether or not he's going to be taught the game the right way, not necessarily always about the scheme and the plays, but how to play the game of football and what it can teach you about life and more importantly, how we can keep them safe. And so hopefully through that tackling technique that Hank talked to you about, uh, you know, you can go back and that's really the thing that paranoids me the most uh, is just the tackling technique and that full speed collision that happens at the point of attack. And last year in college football, we had a really difficult lesson learned on the, on the, on the kickoff play for the young man at Rutgers. And uh, so hopefully you take a little bit out of that. Before I forget, I'd like to invite everybody up to come watch us play. Uh, we have tickets that are available not only uh, for high school student athletes that are recruits, but also for you as uh, grade school coaches and our high school coaches or administrators. And uh, bring your players up. I know we have some uh, salute to Midwest football games. We believe in what are, to you that don't know me, I did play here at Northwestern in the mid 90s. Uh, we, had, we had a pretty good run. We were 15 and one in the Big Ten over those two years and went back to back Big Ten titles. And I think what's more important than anything else that I learned here as a student athlete under Gary Barnett's leadership was Number one, that I needed to develop. I needed to improve, I needed to get better. And that was in all aspects of my life. And so frankly, who we are, what we believe in as a staff, we have a simple vision and a simple direction. We want to be the best developmental staff that there is in the country. It's a simple statement, but a very complicated equation to get to the solution and to get to the bottom line on how you positively influence 17 to 23 year old young men. You have to rewind back now to when you guys were that age and to the women in, in this room, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, when you were 17 years old, your priorities are completely and totally different from what they are right now. And really what you thought about back then are typically the women that are in this room. You all, all you thought about were girls. Uh, and that was your number one priority. Uh, and in, in some way, shape, or form, uh, somebody had to influence you to understand that, that, that that's important. But what's really important here is how you develop as a young man. And, and how we think you need to do it first and foremost is academically. And, and so we don't take this for granted, but we get the opportunity to coach, and, like I said, develop the best and the brightest that college football has to offer. And how I know that is through the empirical data that I'm able to share with you. In 2010, we had 60 players above a 3.0 and a team GPA above a 3.0. Now they don't have a national stat there because I don't think the NCAA wants everybody to turn in their team GPA after every semester. We have no problem sharing this with anyone that wants to listen. To have 85 guys on scholarship, 105 on the roster, to have 60 of them above a 3.0, I think is something spectacular we're proud of. Last year, I didn't do it, I don't know why you just clapped. Uh, I wish our players were here for you to clap for them, but. We had 32 guys who were academic all Big Ten. So how do you become an academic all Big Ten player? Number one, you're a significant contributor on the field. Number two, you have a GPA above a 3.0, obviously. Uh, and then it keeps going up and up as you want to become an academic all district and academic all American. So we had 32 guys who were named academic all Big Ten. That's number one in the conference and tops of anybody in the, in the country. And we had the number one graduation rate in the country at 100%. And so when you think about that, it's not just lip service here when we talk about what we believe in academically, but more importantly, empirically, what we're trying to talk to our guys, it's about being a student athlete. And I learned back when I was at Carl Sandburg High School, when I was a sophomore from my father, I took this class called Geometry, I think we've all taken it before. Uh, I just didn't quite get it. I really struggled with it. Uh, I could play pool pretty well, but I, I didn't understand geometry. Uh, so with that being said, in my first grade that came in, my sophomore year in the fall, the geometry was a D. And I went home and I gave, turned in my progress report to my parents. And, and back then you actually had to show it to your parents. Now we got all these crazy laws that your parents don't know your grades and all that. So I showed my parents my grades and uh, the next thing that happened is I was told I was not playing football anymore. Well, for a guy who's a sophomore, you know, like 15, 16 years old, as you can imagine, uh, devastation. Uh, <laughs> said it pretty quickly because I thought my identity was a, is a football player. That's who I was, that's what I, that's what I was all about. I was a football player. 
And now my father and my mother took football away from me because I got a D in this, this geometry class. It was a real quick understanding and, and appreciation for what uh, I was really doing with football. It was a privilege to play. All right, it wasn't a right, it was a privilege. And so uh, to look at those things that we've accomplished, we're proud of it. We followed them up last year with 54 players above a 3.0, and we had a team record GPA of a 3.02, and now we've gone seven straight quarters with 50 players above. And, and what I'm saying this all for is, all of you did not, not one person outside of my staff raise your hand saying that you're a professional coach. That's all you do. You get compensated to just be a coach. You do it out of the goodness of your heart because it's a calling. And I would say this right now, Outside of my mom and dad, those who influenced me more than anybody else were my coaches. And I go back to when I started when I was in the second grade in the Pioneers. There were a couple of coaches that almost forced me to quit the game because they didn't teach me and coach me the right way. They didn't take out and embody the PCA and coach me up. They were trying to tear me down. But then I got to about the third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, and I had some coaches that it took me a little while because I was doing pretty well in school all the way to that geometry class. But the first thing they asked me when I went to that 6 o'clock practice was, Hey Fitz, how's school going? Your, your grades going well? Everything. And so I was hearing it revolving in my life. My mom and dad were on me. I went to football practice. My coaches were on me. And then I had the great privilege to play the game of football. And so I, I, would, I would stress to you that you have no idea the power of influence that you have. And I know you do because you love it and it's your calling and it's your passion. But don't lose sight of that. And, and, and Coach Walker, who's you know, down looking at us right now, a great mentor and a great friend, he used to say, keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing for all of us in life is to be the best people we can be. And when it comes to the game of football, hopefully we stress to our young people that it's a privilege. Take care of your academics first. If you do that, you're going to be successful long after you get done playing the game. Long after that. And for us, we talk about a lot of things, and, and I'm going to go over our values and, and what's important to us. And as you can see, I'm a John Wooden disciple. Uh, back in, when I was an eighth grader, I wrote a book report on John Wooden. And I, you know what's crazy today? The guys that I coach have no idea who John Wooden is. They know he passed away recently because there was some news about him. But they have no idea who he is. And I don't know about you, but I think he's the best coach ever to live. And what a great role model for all of us. And so when we studied back in 2008, we had, had a, a, a decent season. We won six football games. The biggest thing holding us back was us. I had not created and set a clear set of values that we needed to live our life on and live, live our football life on and who we were going to be as people. And so we got together with our leadership council, and I don't have enough time to talk through all that, but we created and we studied through Coach Wood a set of values kind of through the structure of his pyramid of success. And I'm sure a lot of you have read that and seen that. Uh, but we wanted to make it our own. We wanted to have ownership of it. We wanted to have what we believed here in our program. And what I want to go through quickly here, because uh, I know my time is limited, is through our 10 values. And then kind of what the questions we ask, frankly, in recruiting, as we're looking at student athletes, to see exactly who they are and what they're all about. And so I want to go over, first and foremost, the cornerstone of our program, and that's attitude. And when you think back to when you woke up this morning and you saw the sunshine and I don't know what you had to do yesterday for work, the first thing you chose was your attitude. It's a, it's a God-given talent from a standpoint that no one else controls it. And it's the ultimate talent that we all have. And when you think about the attitude that you choose, you could have the worst day of your life professionally. But the minute you walk on the field as a coach, your kids are going to look at your attitude because either you're going to coach them up or you're going to sit there and be a sour face and you're going to be a negative person and you're going to tear them down. It's that simple. And you know what? Those kids you coach, they don't care. They really don't care if you just got promoted to a CEO or you just got fired. You're the one that chose to be a coach. You're the one that chooses to go out there on the field with them and put a, a whistle around your neck. You're the one that chooses to be an administrator and run a youth football program. So those kids really don't care whether or not it's a good day or a great day. They just want and expect that you're having a great day. And so that's a challenge each and every one of us when it comes to influencing kids. And so when I look at the kids that we want to coach, I want to make sure that that's what they have inside of them, a game of football. Yeah, kids like getting their name called. We've got these websites now that tell them how good they are by putting stars after their names. I think that's the biggest joke and the biggest force in society. I was a negative star player. I ended up being a two-time All-American. Okay? So I don't believe in any of that garbage. And so you parents that have kids that are in high school and you subscribe to those websites, shame on you. 
You're wasting your money. Donate it to charity. It can be spent and used in a lot better ways. Because it comes down to love and passion. And if they don't love our game, it's going to get really, really tough, like life is going to get. And so if you don't like practice, you're not going to be very good. They all love games. But at the end of the day, do they love the hard parts of games? And then it goes down to film study. And for us, at our level, it's the way we go. You see, we, we, we play 12 games in the regular season to get an opportunity for a 13th. Let me put this in perspective. A game lasts three hours. You're in the arena in Big Ten, BCS, college football for 36 hours of the year. For the opportunity for 39 hours in the Big Ten championship game, for 42 hours to play in a bowl game. That's less than 48 hours, so let's round up, though, just to keep it simple in the math. Again, I struggled in geometry. 48 hours is the amount of time that our kids are actually in the arena, which equates to two days. Two days. Multiply that by four years. I'm not the smartest guy again. They're actually in the stadium for eight days of their experience in college. They better love what they're doing. Because the cheerleaders, the band, their mom and dad aren't there. There's just us grinding on them. Okay? And then what's expected of them from a standpoint academically. And then how do they take coaching? A lot of kids today, and you're probably seeing it, you're probably seeing it from the parents, could go on Google and tell you how to coach the quarterback better. Mick sees it. Hank sees it. We all see it. I've got this personal trainer back home that thinks that I should be doing this or that. We really don't care what their personal trainer thinks or what Google thinks or all that. So we want to make sure when they come to our program, they've got the right attitude. Second, I think what's lost today, uh, and, and Mick alluded to it earlier, uh, is investment. And we define investment as consistent hard work over time. Consistent hard work over time. And so do they go above and beyond uh, on and off the field in everything that they do? This plays a picture of our game against Illinois two years ago. We were up by two, uh, three scores, and Illinois tried to do a surprise onside. They tried to do that little bunt kick. Uh, Hunter Bates is that young man catching that ball. Maybe you've heard of his father, Bill Bates, great player for the Dallas Cowboys. The last thing you teach your kickoff return, or the first thing and the last thing you teach your kickoff return guys in that front line is see the ball kicked and don't leave until the ball is kicked. And you say it over and over and over and over again. Here we are playing our rival on the road. We just, they just scored. And you know what, we're, we're, we're not very happy. And you can see there's three guys in the pumpkin jerseys surrounding Hunter. He goes up, he's catching his ball. You can see how high he is. He's up at the guy's shoulders length. And all he did was his job that day. But he invested greatly over time because he's one of our best special teams players. And that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that think about anyone here who's over the age of 30 understands what a library is. Kids today don't understand what a library is. It's just a place with air conditioning to go when it's hot out. For all of us to gain knowledge, we had to go to a library, go to a card catalog, and use this thing called the Dewey Decimal System. Pull it out, find the number, it, meant it was somewhere up in the library. If the book was there, we could find it, pull it off the shelf, and read and gain knowledge. And as Mick alluded to earlier, kids today can gain it all on something about this bit. And so there's a positive from that, that they are gaining knowledge, or they're gaining information. But it's our job as educators to teach them what knowledge is. And there's a big difference there. I think the biggest thing missing in, in a society of instant gratification, and I have it at our level, I've got kids that graduate with a Northwestern degree that have done internships, summer jobs, and all nine yards, and now all of a sudden they walk into a job after they get done playing football and expect to be the vice president of the company. It's not the way the world works. You've got kids that because they were a good player in the third grade expect to be a great player in the fourth grade. At the high school level, it's the same thing. I was the best player in the eighth grade. I was MVP of 8th grade, 6th grade, 4th grade. Well, you, you were good, but now all of a sudden competition eventually catches up. So to try to teach kids to understand that consistent hard work over time with a great attitude, in our opinion at Northwestern, is a great roadmap to success. We believe if we've got those two cornerstones in place, we're, getting, we're heading down the right road. And then we fill it in with eight more values, and I'll go quickly because I know my time is limited, but we believe that trust is lost today. And we ask a lot of questions, but two, two in particular 
Do his teammates trust him to do his job at all times? And in our opinion, it's critically important. Do you trust that student athlete to lead the football team? I get excited when I hear from our coaches that the young people we're recruiting are captains. If they're not captains with you, and they're not captains in high school, in my opinion, then they're followers. And I'm okay with a young man that's a positive and a good follower, but I like putting a team together full of leaders. Because if they've led at your level and led at the high school level, then they're going to be willing to get out of their comfort zone and lead at our level. And how that happens is through trust. And I don't want to be redundant, but we think what's lost today is the ability to communicate. To look eye to eye and tell people the things that they need to hear. That's how you earn trust. And it happens over time. And for us, it plays very simply into the next aspect of our, of our foundation of our program and our values is character. And you probably all preach it, we do here. We define character as who you are when no one's watching. Character is who you are when no one's watching. You know, right now, you know, you guys are all parents and you probably have kids in your way. Let's fast forward and now you're me. And so I'm a parent, so to speak, of 110, 17 to 23 year old men that attend Northwestern University in the backyard of Chicago in a wonderful community called Evanston. There's sin here in town, just so you wanted to know. It's Saturday night, and there's a kegger going on somewhere. And I tell the guys all the time, over in that corner is a young lady who's intoxicated and passed out, who's getting ready to be taken advantage of. Over there is marijuana, and, and that's a bad choice. Uh, but also in that corner is cocaine and, and, and amphetamines and a whole nine yards. Back over there is a bunch of guys with weapons that want to get in a fight and fight you just because you're a football player. And over there is your car to go home. And if you've had a few beers to drink, it's calling for you to get you home. See, that happens for kids that I get to coach because that's reality in college. It's called sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And if they're not men of character and they don't make great choices and they don't understand that they're part of something bigger, I don't understand that simple question. Character is who you are when no one's watching. They won't ask the question. Hey coach, should I be here? Look on that shoulder. Hey mom and dad, should I be here? And they just shook their head no. And I tell them if they shake their head no, it's time to go. And they're going through all those crazy feelings inside of them for the first time. Think about right now when the pool's open at your house. Think about when you go to that wedding over the weekend when they're a freshman, sophomore, and junior in high school. They're gonna figure out whose parents go, to, go away and who can, where they can throw the keg party. See, I'm not that far removed, so unfortunately for our guys, I forget that uh, we actually weren't all born as adults. And uh, so, and I talk to them all the time about, I'm not being a hypocrite, I made all those poor choices, I just was fortunate to get away with it. But here's what I learned, and here's the pitfalls that go along with it. So we ask a lot of times, do they go, and do they work to their potential in all aspects of their life, especially when no one's watching? This is a picture of uh, St. Baldrick's. This is a group of guys that we did a uh, St. Baldrick's where you shave your head for pediatric cancer research. It's a foundation that we believe in supporting here at Northwestern. A bunch of guys shaving their heads. You know, here's the crazy thing. The guy that shaved all of our heads passed away last Friday from cancer. Jay the Barber here in Evanston. So teaching guys life lessons and helping them understand. Another aspect of, of, of our program that we value deeply is, is honesty. And I learned it so well back home and I learned it through being a player, but our kids are not willing to be honest with themselves anymore and say, I need help. I don't understand what you're coaching, you're telling me to do. They don't want to show any weakness. They don't want to be and open themselves up. We want to, we want to ask kids, are, you, are they honest with themselves even when it gets hard? And then most importantly, do they take responsibility? Do they take responsibility for their actions? We've got some really tough examples right now, and I just lost a really great friend in the profession, Jimmy Trussell. Great friend. Someone that I admire, someone that I hope that we can build our program and have in six straight Big Ten championships with. You know, a guy that I learned a lot from him was very gracious, but he made some poor choices. And it all came back down to honesty. That's what it came back down to. He had information, he didn't share it. And it was honesty. That's a tough deal. And I think anyone that was influenced by Coach will tell me he's a most positive influences that they've ever had in their life. But when we think about it, can we and will we be honest even when we make mistakes? That's taking responsibility. And in my opinion, that's a critical, critical crossroads that we're in right now in college football. You know, we want to win a national championship here, and we believe we're going to win a national championship here. 
more importantly, we're going to teach our guys to do the right things and, and be honest so that we can be people of integrity and what we think be a part of the family. And I think back to when my dad was teaching me about how when he was on the south side of Chicago going to St. Rita in the 60s and how it was tough. It was really tough. It was a tough society back then. And there was a lot of people that didn't get along just because of race, color, creed. I can keep going on and on and on. And there were a lot of things and it was a, it was a tumultuous time in, in our society. I think this is one of the coolest pictures I've ever seen. Young African-American young man with his arm around another. One of our Caucasian players walking off the field. That's brotherhood. That's family. And that's right at the core of what we believe in, is family. And so do they have close friends on the team? Do they understand brotherhood? What's their home life like? And I'm not necessarily so that every young person, every young man has to have that nuclear mom and dad, or they need to have uh, a huge support network. All it takes is one person to look in that, in that young man's eyes and say, this is how we do it in this family. This is what we believe is important, and then hold them to that high standard of expectations. Back in the South Side, when I grew up, we were an Irish Catholic family, and uh, when I needed a hug and it was emotional, we, we hugged each other and we embraced. Kind of like that man hug that was going on here earlier between Chris and Timmy. I've got that on tape, just so you know. That'll come out on a later date. But uh, we had no problem hugging and, and embracing. But my dad wore a size 10, I now wear a size 12, and I know exactly where to stick my shoe it's where the sun doesn't shine when we're not acting the right way. And I've got three little rascals that are six, four, and two, Jack, Ryan, and Brendan. And uh, we went on this little 5K walk this morning. And me and my little four-year-old had a little positive conversation about how we were going to act today. And so I, I think that's important. And, and uh, you know, they need to understand that they're responsible for their actions and responsible for something bigger. And as long as I'm the head football coach here, we're going to wear the N on our chest, and we're going to put it on our helmet. And now we're going to have the names in the back of our jerseys. Because, yeah, not only do we know we're going to play for Northwestern, something bigger than us, but also for us to get here, for Fitzgerald to go in the back of my jersey, okay, there are a bunch of coaches that helped me get there. There are a bunch of family members that helped me get there. My mom and dad were on, uh, on the board to help run the, the concession stand when I was playing football. My dad never coached me, but they were on that committee that made the chili on the cold Friday or cold Saturdays and Sundays when we were playing. So they sacrificed greatly. My sisters were cheerleaders. They had to follow around and listen to how good I was. You think they enjoyed that? They hate that. They still do, but that's okay. All right. uh, and then I'll, I'll move forward quickly here, but the last and our second uh, level of values is about respect. And understanding, uh, do, they, do they want to treat, be treated the way that others are treated? Uh, they want themselves treated. Uh, uh, do they want to treat those other people the way that they want to be treated? And more importantly, when I look at young people today, they just don't quite get and understand the opportunity and the privilege that they have. I'll go back to that Ohio State example. There's a young man that just got banned from the program for five years based on the choices that he made. Did he really respect the opportunity that he had to be at that program? And in society today, you know, back when we were playing, probably growing up, if you made those kind of poor choices, you came here in the basketball arena and winter workouts, you ran up and down the steps until you puked, did it for a week, and the coach said, don't ever do that again, and he never did it again. You can't do that anymore. Not in today's society. We had a Big Ten kickoff luncheon here over the last two days in Chicago. TMZ brought a camera crew to follow around the student athletes as they partied in Chicago. Different society. How are their relationships with their coaches, with their teachers, with women? Do they understand what it means to be here in a program like we have at Northwestern and those that helped us get here to this point and respect that? Like Eric Parsegian that we had come back and speak to our team a year ago and those that are going to come after us. Because I can tell you this right now, the young man that made that mistake in Columbus just ruined that program forever. Forever. And I know he wasn't the only one, but that's, that's the most talked about example. Then it gets kind of up into, into the daily action, but we, we, define, we, we value effort. We think effort is to go as hard as you can for as long as you can. Effort is to go as hard as you can for as long as you can in everything that you do. And so you might see our guys a little bit tap on their helmet. That doesn't mean that it's a, a sign of weakness in our program. That's actually going back to communication with our offense because we play so fast. We want our guys to be honest with themselves and play so hard that they get to a point of exhaustion and then they let their teammate go in. And so I heard Mike Singletary talk uh, as a student athlete when I was here at Northwestern. And uh, he talked about how he went about conditioning his mind and his body to get ready to play in the summer. And he didn't do it initially, but he did it when he got to the Bears and he realized that everybody was as good as he was. 
And so this is how he approached conditioning. The strength coach said we had to run 10 100s today. And the linebackers had to make it in 16 seconds. And so he, he changed his mindset. Instead of just making the time in 16 seconds and making the 10 100-yard sprints, he was going to go as hard as he could for as long as he could. So he was going to go out that first rep, and if he could make it in 12 seconds, he made it in 12 seconds. The next rep, he got on the line, did it again in 12 seconds, or 13. The next time he ran it, about 15. He got three reps in. By the time he got to number four, he couldn't make the time. He knew there was going to be a consequence to that action. He knew the coach would be upset. He knew for a moment he would be a failure. So he didn't make number four, number five, and number six. He didn't even make the time. But number seven, he made the time again. Number eight, he made the time again. Number nine, he made it back again in 12 seconds. And number, number 10, he barely made it. So he evaluated his functional conditioning and he said, you know what, I could go as hard as I could for as long as I could for three reps. The next time I run, I'm gonna make four. And so by the time he got to the end of the summer, by the time he got out of training camp, he was the best conditioned football player, not only on the Chicago Bears, but in the universe. Because he could go 10 out of 10 as hard as he could for as long as he could. And that was a conscious decision to make, an effort decision in his mind. And he was gonna be willing to risk the sacrifice, or risk the consequences and sacrifice initially. And that's the mindset that we want our guys going. So when we condition, we get ready to go, and we only do it in winter workouts and our strength coaches only do it in the summer. I do not condition the team in season, in spring ball or during the season, because of the tempo we practice in. So I say, go, and they start running. Time, because I don't want them to condition about worrying about the time, but more importantly, going as hard as they can for as long as they can. So we look at a few things. How about when you have to respond, right? Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% what you do about it. And so we want to see how tough they are mentally and physically. Are they going to pay, play through pain? It's a tough game. It's a physical game. And there's a difference between being injured and being hurt. I know that. I have a stinger going on right now. Doc and I were talking earlier. My last practice with the Dallas Cowboys, I took on a 270-pound fullback the wrong way. So I threw out the first pitch at the White Sox game yesterday. I slept the wrong way. I've been in four different beds in four days, and I can't put to my left. Oh well, I do it 10 times harder again. I just use better technique, but you know, it's about how you respond to things and how do they handle poor plays and adversity. Coach Hank talked about our defense last year. I just went through two days of media and I got probably 5,000 questions about how we're gonna improve our defense this year. Little did they know I recorded it on my PDA and I'm just gonna keep playing it over and over and over again for our players. How you respond is you do it boldly. You do something about it. You don't feel sorry for yourself. You get back to what you believe in, and you go at it as hard as you possibly can. You take a critical eye at it, you evaluate it, and you look first at yourself as a coach so you can do a better job teaching. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for kids today. It really is, because like I alluded to earlier, everybody's telling them how good they are. Do your kids a favor and tell them just it's not about how, what other people say about you. More importantly, it's how you feel about yourself inside and how you're going to enjoy the journey and improve and get better as a person, as a student, and hopefully as an athlete. And then at the, at the top of our value pyramid is an acronym for what's important now, or when. What's important now. And so we, we want to know if losing bothers them and what they're going to be willing to do about it in all aspects of their life. Everybody wants to be a winner, but can they identify what's important now in their life? Like that young lady that's passed out over there at a party tonight on the college campus. What's important now? Go help her get home safe, even if you don't know her. See that temptation over there called drugs? Even if the hottest girl on campus is over there smoking weed, don't do it. Walk away from it. It's not going to get you where you want to go. And just because you're a football player, don't go pound your chest because you're big and strong. Don't go get in a bar fight with some guy because you might, you might not wake up again. And please, oh please, don't make poor choices and do those kind of things and get in a car or do anything that might sacrifice yourself or put yourself at risk. Because it's a privilege to be a part of this game. For us, we believe it's a privilege to be here in Northwestern. And as coaches, we believe it's a privilege to positively influence young men to help them develop to be the best they can be. This is one of my favorite pictures in the world. It's the well-described, well-documented, talked about pink locker room in Iowa City. And that's the home to my first uh, Big Ten win as a football coach, the uh, infamous pink locker room uh, psychologically in Iowa City. So as you can see, everything, even the tiles on top are pink. It's kind of cool. So uh, probably going over my time. I apologize if I have. I appreciate you adjusting the, uh, the schedule for me. I have to run down to the south side to be a part of the family function. But... We appreciate what you do, and TCY 
YFL, they positively influence young men and women uh, through the great game of football, but more importantly, just to be the best people that they can be. And uh, that's what sports teaches us. And we need to get back to that. We need to continue to teach young people to be the best they can be through sports. And in our opinion, the best sport in the world is a great game of football. We have to have 11 heartbeats operate as one. Not some of the time, but all the time. So hopefully you enjoy the, the rest of the speakers. Uh, I know they're going to be a lot better than the three of us just were. And uh, again, you're all invited out to come out and watch us practice at any time. Cody Shader from our staff. Uh, you know, Jeff obviously knows how to get a hold of us, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun. Football is in the air. It's a great time, and uh, uh, have a great season. Thanks so much for, for listening to attention. Okay.